Hey everyone, my name is Rajesh Bayana. So I'm a radiologist in Toronto. So just wanted to thank Keith for having me, for reaching out and inviting me to speak to you guys. I think that radiology is something that isn't really taught much in professional schools in general. And, and as Keith has explained it to me, pretty similar for RTs and for respiratory therapists, you, know, you probably don't get much exposure to CT teaching in school. You know, welcome to the club. So it's the same thing in medical school. When I was in med school, I didn't really have any exposure to radiology initially. And when we do get lectures on radiology, they're often presentations of, you know, interesting cases where you know, someone got stabbed or shot, not that that's interesting or, you know, interesting pathology. And they would show us these cases, but they wouldn't really teach us the basics. So we didn't really know what we were looking at and couldn't really tell what we were seeing in the, in the video. So the goal today, I think, and what I think was missing when I went through school, at least, was just understanding the basics, understanding what we're looking at, understanding what the basic densities are in a CT, orienting yourself to the images, and then understanding the very basic anatomy. So unfortunately, you know, no crazy cases today. We're going to keep it simple. We're going to keep it basic, and we're going to focus on just knowing what we're looking at. So when you are at work and you want to open up a CT chest, you have an idea of what you're looking at and can, can hopefully figure out what's going on with the patient. So I'm going to turn off my video and get started. So let's get started simply. I think that, you know, you guys have all seen several chest x-rays in your careers. So we'll start here with this chest x-ray image. And so the main point that I want to make here is that to create this x-ray image, you know, an x-ray beam is emitted through something, and then it is detected on the other side. So in this particular case with this chest x-ray, an x-ray beam is emitted, detected on the other side, goes through the chest, and how black or white an area on this image is depends on the density of the tissues between the beam on one side and the detector on the other side. So for example, if I were to emit an x-ray beam through this area here in the left lung, most of the beam is going to get through the lung because the lung is relatively low density. It's filled with air and it's going to look pretty black. And then through the bone here, there's the bone, the heart, multiple other structures. You can see part of the aorta here as well. There's a lot of structures here. So there's more dense tissue between the emitter and the detector. So it's going to show up as white. So the takeaway point here is that even on an x-ray, lower density areas like air or gas is going to be blacker. And higher density areas like bone, et cetera, are going to be whiter. Okay. And so for CT, it's a little more complex, but the same principle applies. So more dense structures are going to be whiter and less dense structures are going to be blacker or darker. And so to focus on the very basic principles of CT, uh, not to get into too much physics, basically a CT uses x-rays. And in the most basic terms, if you think about it as shining or emitting x-rays through the body from all angles around the body, and then detecting it on the other side, the CT is able to then, based on what it detects, is able to calculate the density of every single little part of the body. Okay. And so if you imagine your body being split up into millions and millions of tiny cubes of tissue. Those cubes of tissue are called voxels, like pixels, but voxels. So a voxel is a volume pixel or a 3D pixel. And so if you picture the body being made up of millions and millions of little voxels or, or volume pixels, CT is able to calculate the density or attenuation of each of those little tiny cubes. And then the CT, what we're displaying here on this image, for example, is just the density of that little cube of tissue. And this is the composite of all of that anatomy. And so again, denser tissue is going to be brighter and less dense tissue is going to be darker. And so how dense any individual voxel is can be graded on a scale. And that scale is important to know. The scale is called the Hounsfield unit scale. Okay. And so Practically speaking, Hounsfield unit scale ranges from negative 1,000 or so to about, a, about positive 1,000. And the numbers here that we're going to go through aren't super important. 
What's more important is the relativity of the tissues. So understanding what's more dense, what's less dense, and that'll help you understand kind of why things look the way they look on CT. So don't worry about the numbers, just worry about kind of the, the general principles behind it. So by convention, pure water is assigned a value of zero ounce per unit. So that's pure water. Okay. Also by convention, air is assigned a value of negative a thousand. Remember, very dark or very low density things on this side of the scale. Okay, so everything else is calculated based on these two reference points. So water being zero, air being about negative a thousand. Okay, and so again, you know, with these conventions, if you were to say add something to the water, like red blood cells, for example, so say you, know, you have pure water, it's at zero ounce per units, someone has a hematoma or a hemorrhage, now that's water plus packed red blood cells, that's going to be slightly more dense than zero. So you're going to see positive numbers. So things that are very, very dense, like bone, like cortical bone and metal are going to be closer to the positive a thousand. They're nearly at that level. Things like soft tissue, like liver and muscle, for example, you know, it's going to depend on the particular soft tissue regarding the exact density. But again, the exact numbers don't matter. We'll use a ballpark number of about positive 50, but the point is it's slightly greater than water. And then a very basic question, what's more dense? Is water more dense or fat more dense? So where's that going to stand? Think, you know, think for yourself, which side of the, the scale is that going to stand on? And so a lot of people, when they, you know, their knee-jerk reaction when they hear that question is to say fat is more dense than water. But as you all know, if you mix oil and water, oil floats. Fat is less dense than water. So fat is going to show up on the negative side of this scale. Pure fat, like your subcutaneous fat, for example, is going to be about negative 100 Hounsfield units. So again, these numbers are not super important, but I want you to remember, try to you know, understand the basics of the relative densities with water being at about zero, fat being less dense, soft tissue being slightly more dense, and then obviously bone and metal being very, very dense and the very high positive numbers and air like in the lung being very, very negative on that scale. As just a little bit of an aside, um, you know, as many of you guys know, CT scans are all acquired in axial slices. And then there are reformats that are then created in both these sagittal and coronal planes most commonly, but you can basically create any plane. So the CT scanner just acquires in the axial plane, and then that information is used, or that density information is used to reformat in any way you'd like. Okay, and that's where you see those sagittal and coronal reformats. They're not acquiring new series when they do that. That's in contrast to MRI. So an MRI, you're usually acquiring in multiple different planes. You know, acquire an axial, then you'll acquire a sagittal, et cetera. Okay, and so this is a radiologist here on the left. This is the screen that he's reading off of. So he happens to be looking at an MRI. But let's pretend that he's looking at a, a CT for now. And when you're looking at an axial CT, just to understand the basic convention, you want to picture the patient's head in the screen like this and their feet towards you. Okay, so if you picture the patient oriented like this with their head in the screen and their feet towards you, when you see an axial slice of the abdomen or chest or whatever, it'll make the conventions more obvious. So again, if you picture the patient's head in the screen and their feet towards you, it'll be natural to understand why this side over here, so the left side of the screen, if you can't see my cursor, is actually the right side of the patient. So this is the right side of the patient over here. So this is their part of their liver here on the right side of the patient. This is the left side of the patient over here, okay? This is the anterior patient, so the patient's belly, and this is the back of the patient. You can see the patient's spine here clearly, very bright, and you can see part of the CT table at the bottom here, okay? So those are the conventions. Remember the right side over here, left side over here. This is the belly or anteriorly, and this is posteriorly. Okay, and so let's apply those Hounsfield units on, you know, a real CT. So I'll just pull up a CT chest here. And just to have a look at kind of, you know, those, you know, the basic principles, 
So, you know, you have the measurement tool, you have the ROI tool, which again, you'll see on any of these, these pack systems or even on your Epic system, when you open up images and it's that little circle, it's called the ROI for region of interest. And basically if you put a region of interest anywhere on, a, on a, an image, like say in the trachea here, you'll see a bunch of numbers come up. The one that you want to focus on for now is the mean or just the average density. And that'll show you, you know, it says HU here. This is about negative 952 HU. So remember gas is by convention around negative a thousand. So it checks out very close to negative a thousand. That's the density you would expect for gas. And it shows up as very, very black. So notice that the lungs are also showing up as very, very black. Also, you know, there's lung tissue here as well. Very, very negative. This is about negative 843 ounce per units. If I were to, you know, go down into the abdomen, for example, and scroll down here and put an ROI on the gallbladder, which is filled with bile, which is kind of close to fluid. It's basically water plus other things. The mean here it might be hard to read, but it says about 19 pounds per unit. So close to zero. Okay, usually simple fluid is anywhere from zero to 20 pounds per units or so. Again, numbers aren't super important, just proving the point. And then, you know, we asked the question about soft tissue. This is a Again, with contrast, but if I put an ROI on the muscle belly in the spine here, it's about 60 pounds per units. And again, fat being much less dense than water. If I put an ROI on the subcutaneous tissues, you'll see that it's about negative hundred here. It's about negative 110. And that all checks out with your eyes too. So the subcutaneous fat here is pretty dark. The gas is darker and you can clearly see soft tissue is brighter. Okay. And that kind of explains the principle of, if you guys have heard or ever heard of the term fat stranding before, fat stranding just refers to kind of a inflammatory process in the fat. So usually fat is very clean, like the subcutaneous tissues here, or like the intra-abdominal fat that I'm showing you here with my cursor. It's usually very clean looking. When you have inflammation, all you have is fluid that's kind of extending into that fatty space. And it makes the fat look dirty because water, like in the CSF space here, or, um, you know, if you train your eye to what this fluid looks like in the, the gallbladder here is clearly brighter than the fat. Okay. So if we look at the CT here again, you know, you can see why the lungs look the way they look on this soft tissue window. You can see why fat looks like the way it looks and you can see why bone or understand why bone is so bright on these images as well. Okay, and we'll get back to windowing in, in just a little bit. Okay, so to take that another step further, so this is a CT head. I know you probably won't be looking at too many CT heads, but again, it's the principle here. If you pull this up and you see this is normal brain, this is bone that's very bright, there's this really dark spot here. So what is that? It looks almost entirely black. So you could you know, jump to the conclusion and say, hey, this is just air. And if there's air in the brain, that's a bad thing, or called pneumocephalus. And you would say, hey, there's air in the brain, there's pneumocephalus, I think there might be a fracture, or there's some other, you know, process that's leading to this, you know, very acute, potentially acute finding, or maybe they had surgery recently, I don't know why they have gas in their brain, right? That would be scary. But if you put an ROI on that, it's actually around negative 100. So this is fat, right? So even though it looks really, really black to your eye, you know, you do a little check and you see the ROI is around negative 100, this is fat. Okay. And that means something completely different. So, you know, it's normal to have fat all on the falks here, on uh, the midline. So this would just be a normal finding and, and not gas. So clearly, you know, knowing these densities and understanding the very basic principle has big clinical implications if you're a radiologist, but even if you just open up a scan and have a look, it also has a big implication when you're looking at them as well. Okay. And so it might be confusing at this point to think, why is the fat black? I thought that gas or, or air is supposed to be black, fat is supposed to be a little bit brighter, like I showed you in these images here, right? So why is, why is the fat so black? And that has to do with windowing. And that brings me to the next big principle or big takeaway that I, I want you guys to, to understand uh, today. And so I'm sure you guys have all heard the terms, you know, lung window, soft tissue window, bone window, or notice that the CT can look very differently depending on which quote unquote setting you have it on. But I think it's important to understand what that actually means so that you know why it looks the way it looks. Okay. So, so far in the simplest terms, we've understood the 
you know, CT scans are essentially measuring and displaying densities of each of the little voxels or volumes of tissue. And that has a value associated with it called the Hounsfield unit scale. And when we're looking at a CT with our own eyes, all we're looking at is the differences in density between structures to help identify pathology. Okay. So for example, if we say had the liver and we saw a lesion in the liver that was lower density, the reason why we're picking it up is because we can see the visual representation of a lower density thing on a background of a higher density liver. But our eyes can only detect a finite number of shades of gray. Okay. I think that number is about 30 or so, but it doesn't matter what the actual number is. The point is, is that our eyes don't operate on, a, on an actual continuum. We can only detect a discrete number of shades of gray. Okay. And so if we were to take all of those shades of gray that we can see from black to white and distribute those on a very broad scale from negative a thousand all the way to positive a thousand, each individual shade of gray is representing a big range of tissues. Okay. So for example, if we know that water is around zero and soft tissues are all kind of around the 50, 60, 70 mark, if say the a liver was 80 Hounsfield units and a lesion in the liver was 40 Hounsfield units, we're, o we're only, if we were to use this window where there's a broad distribution of these shades of gray, it's going to be hard to see that lesion because the shade of gray that's representing the lesion is only one away from the background liver. So if we were to use this very broad representation, you know, it wouldn't be conducive to necessarily seeing that lesion. The principle of windowing is essentially the principle of how we distribute these shades of gray on this scale. And there are two numbers that define any window. And you're going to see these, these numbers at the bottom of any CT scan you're looking at. They'll be marked as W for width and L for level. Okay. And the width and the level define the window. So for example, in this particular case, the width of this window, which is distributed from negative a thousand to positive a thousand, obviously is 2000. So it spans 2000 Hounsfield units and the level is zero. The level refers to the center point of that window. Okay. So these two numbers automatically define what this is. It's centered at zero and spans 2000. And if I pull up a CT scan with that window that I just described, you'll see that it kind of looks washed out. So the kidneys are here. The fat is here. The liver is here. Just remember what the liver looks like here. It all looks pretty homogeneous. Okay. Notice that you can see that the black in air or gas at negative a thousand stands out. So to our benefit, if we want to look for the distribution of gas, we might make the, the window very, very wide. So everything washes out and we can really see the gas. Okay. So now let's distribute the shades of gray a little bit differently. So let's look at what a typical soft tissue window might look like. So instead of distributing the, the shades of gray across the entire scale, we're now distributing all of the shades of gray between two numbers that are closer to the soft tissue range. This is a soft tissue window. So a basic important point is to remember that the CT is just displaying the same density information, no matter what the window is, but we change the window to make things look different in order for our eyes to pick up the density differences between those tissues. Okay. So here the window is centered or the level is at 50. So the level is 50. So it's centered at about 50 and the width is 400. So there's 200 on each side of the 50. So it goes up to about 250 and down to about negative 150. Okay. So everything below negative 150 or everything below the bottom of the window is going to show up as completely black. Everything above the top of the window. So in this case, 250 is going to show up as completely white. And then everything in between is going to be represented by a different shade of gray, depending on where it is on that scale. So if I were to pull up that same exact CT slice on a soft tissue window, you'll notice that you can really tell the difference between say the fat in the kidney a lot better because we're centered on the soft tissues. 
If you look at this liver, you'll also notice that you can pick up that, you know, you probably couldn't see it before that there's a small potential lesion here. There's something that looks a little darker in the liver here. So when we center on the soft tissue, we can, we can see it a little bit better. And then let's take that one step further. Let's narrow the window even more. So people will talk about narrowing the window, widening the window. So initially we had a very wide window. Now we have a narrow window. Let's narrow it even more. So I just tightened that a little bit more and notice the numbers changed. So I'm still centered at 50. The level is still 50, but the width is not 400 anymore. It's 150. So we've tightened or narrowed that window. So the bottom, again, if it's centered at 50 and the width is 150, we only have 75 on each side. So we're going from negative 25 to 125. Okay, again, everything above that's going to be white. Everything below a negative 25 is going to be black. So that means, you know, if we have fat, fat's about negative 100, that's going to show up as completely black. And gas is also going to show up as completely black. So gas and fat are going to look the same on the image, despite being very different in density. But let's look at this very narrow window. So again, notice that things like gas in the bow and fat are essentially completely black on this very narrow window. But also notice that because we're centered and we've tightened those shades of gray, differences in density within the window are going to show up a lot better to our eyes. So now that I've narrowed the window, you can see this lesion so much better. So there's a lesion here in the background liver and it stands out as very dark on a very bright background. So we've now been able to pick up that lesion. And the basic principle is just understanding the windows. So you know why things look a little differently. Very wide windows, whatever they are, can be used to pick up things like gas where it shouldn't be. Very narrow windows can be used to pick up things like subtle differences in density in the liver, for example. And we've shown you an example of a soft tissue window. So more relevant to the lung, for example, we'll use soft tissue windows to look at the mediastinum. We'll use lung windows. Like this image on the right here is a lung window to look at the lungs. Notice that we're centered on or the level is negative 600. So in the very, very dark or low range where you'd expect the lung to be because it's mostly gas and the width is very wide. So the, the trachea, which is pure gas is gonna show up as black but the lung is going to have more detail to it. Now it doesn't look so black because we're, we're kind of centered on the lung here. Notice that everything else though, because we're centered so low is going to look white. So even the soft tissues, the bones, it all looks pretty, pretty white. And it's more difficult to see the difference between them. And then if you're looking at the bones, let's say you want to see if your patient has a fracture or something, notice how much better we can see the detail of the bones on the bone window. So the bottom left image here is a bone window. And as you'd expect, the center, the level of that window is very high in the bone range, and we have a very wide window as well. Okay, so, so far we've talked about a couple of things. We've talked about basic densities. We've talked about windowing and the principle of windowing. So, you know, what you're looking at and the basic takeaways, if you pull up a CT in practice, the two things that you're probably going to most commonly look at is a soft tissue window to look at the mediastinum and then a lung window to look at the lungs. Now, the next thing that I want to uh, briefly just introduce is the discussion about IV contrast and the different phases specifically on chest CT. The principle is pretty simple. The contrast that's used in CT is iodinated contrast or has iodine in it. It's very, very bright on the images. So it's very, very dense. And when we give that contrast, it's going to make the vessels look way brighter than a non-contrast scan. So if I just pull up this non-contrast scan, for example, you'll see that the aorta is kind of similar to the soft tissues or, you know, it's filled with blood. So it's, it's going to be brighter than fluid, but around 50 ounce units or so. Uh, I notice that the organs are all very dark because they're just, we're just representing their soft tissue. If we give IV contrast, it's going to make the vessels very bright. So we can see detail in the vessels. And it's also going to, you know, distribute into the soft tissues eventually. And the organs are going to enhance and pathology is also going to enhance. So the principle though is very simple. Essentially the contrast is injected into the veins of the patient. Okay. And the principle is they inject it into the veins. You wait a certain amount of time and then you image and how long we wait between injection and imaging is going to drastically change the way that the image looks. And that's, what's responsible solely for 
or in, in large part at least, or the vast majority, why the image looks the way it looks, why you may have a CTPA or a pulmonary angiogram versus a CTA versus, you know, in the abdomen, a portal venous phase or a delay, all that's about how long you wait. Okay. This is very carefully controlled to essentially give you the view that you need or want to be able to, to pick up pathology in the specific clinical setting. So if you want a CTPA, you don't want a delayed phase, you want a CTPA so you can rule out pulmonary embolism, okay? And so the most commonly encountered phases, just a basic understanding of, you know, very basic cardiac anatomy kind of makes it make sense. So if you inject IV contrast into a vein, it's gonna to return to the right heart, okay? So it's gonna to return to the right heart it's going to pump out into the pulmonary arteries first. It's going to go into the lungs. It's going to come back into the pulmonary veins, into the left heart, and then into the aorta. Okay, from the aorta, it goes to the rest of the body. Okay, so very basic, you know, flow of blood. And again, we're injecting that into the venous system or into the IV. So if you think about it, if you were to image very, very early, or about 15 seconds or so, the contrast at about 15 seconds after injection is going to be in the right heart and mostly in the pulmonary arteries. So a CTPA or, or rule out PECT, that's all it is. We're just injecting the contrast at a, at a you know, very fast speed. Um, and then we're imaging pretty early. So all the contrast is in the pulmonary artery. And then we can look for filling defects because a clot is going to look very dark in contrast to a very bright pulmonary artery. And that's when, when a CTPA occurs. If we were to wait a little bit longer, as I mentioned, contrast is going to go into the lungs and it's going to come back into the left heart and into the aorta. So if you wait a little bit longer, about 20 seconds or so, most of the contrast is now going to be in the aorta. So if you're looking for something like an aortic dissection, you might want to wait a little bit longer. Sometimes people will try to do a, a quote unquote triple rule out scan to rule out both PE and uh, an aortic dissection. If you see those, they're trying to essentially split the difference and get a pretty good amount of contrast in the pulmonary artery and in the aorta, but you oftentimes sacrifice a little bit on one of them. Generally though, you can, you can do it pretty well. And most commonly, at least at our institution, we do either a CTPA or a CTAA, depending on the clinical scenario. And then if you wait even longer and the contrast distributes into the body elsewhere, you get more of a routine contrast enhanced study. And that's kind of what's done for most things like staging and other common indications where you're going to see enhancement of other structures much better, like lesions and other structures in the mediastinum, like nodes, for example. Okay. And so I'll just pull up images of that. So this is, say you inject contrast, you wait 15 seconds. This is what a CTPA or a pulmonary angiogram is going to look like. Notice that the contrast is in the pulmonary artery here, and you're going to pick up PEs very nicely that are going to look dark in comparison. This in the middle here, you now waited a little bit longer. Notice that the pulmonary artery is less dense now, but the aorta, which is here, is very, very bright. Okay, so this is a CTA. And then here on the bottom right, we have a normal routine contrast enhanced study. Notice that the arteries in the pulmonary artery is not super, super bright but you can see that there's enhancement of the pericardium here. Again, we'll go through the anatomy in a bit. So not important for now, but just notice the differences in appearance. And now you understand hopefully why it looks like it looks like. Okay, so the take-home point so far, if you take anything away from you know, this first introductory half, it's the Hounsfield unit scale, understanding why things look like they do, understanding the conventions. You know, We acquire an axial, then reconstruct. You know, where the right side of the patient is, the left side of the patient is the front and the back. Understanding basic principles of windowing, why the images look like the way they do. So if you see something that's black, it's not necessarily gas. It could be fat. You've got to make sure it's windowed appropriately. And knowing that you're most commonly going to use a lung window or a soft tissue window in your practice. The phases of contrast to understand what a CTPA is, what a CTA is, and what a routine CT looks like, as well as a non-contrast and just basically understanding CT at its core. So I hope that was helpful so far. I want this to be a little bit interactive in the sense that you'll be able to work through the CT chest on your own. So what's gonna happen is 
We're going to have a CT chest up that's going to have labeled anatomy. And it's going to go through each of those structures with kind of my voice over it, explaining each of the structures. If you use your phones, you can pull up the scan using the QR code on the screen. And that'll actually bring up the CT for you. And then on the top left, there's four yellow boxes that you can click. And that can bring up the lung window, which is the fourth one down. If you click that, you'll bring up the lung window and you can go back to the soft tissue window. So just start on the axial soft tissue window and you can change windows using that on the top left. So hopefully you can see my CT chest now. This is essentially what you should be seeing. And if you're on your computer, you'll see all the different series on the left in different planes. So again, we have acquired an axial. This is a soft tissue window here. You can change the windows via the windowing tool here. There's a lung window, for example, a bone window, but there's also usually, um, you know, a lung reconstruction that is a little bit sharper in appearance, uh, that's already in default in lung window. So you can pull that up when appropriate, but hopefully you guys have access by now. So you can use the link if you're on a computer and have the video side by side with it, or you can use your phone using the QR code that I had on the screen. I'll just pull that back up for a second and you know, I'll give you guys a minute or so to pull that up. So I think that should be good for everyone who needs a QR code. I'm gonna stare the other screen. So I'm going to now play this. This is about 20 minutes. Just as a little preface, this goes into some detail. So I wanna, again, ensure, just focus on the big principles and kind of take the anatomy that you want to out of it. And if you wanna learn more, it's gonna be there, but focus on the bigger principles. I don't know Keith, if, if the segmental anatomy of the lung is very important. I don't think it probably is. So I can skip through that section when it gets there. Axial images of the chest. Most of what we're interested in here is within the thoracic cavity. And the thoracic cavity is this entire cavity that is surrounded by chest wall, which includes the bones and muscles that surround the cavity. The thoracic cavity extends all the way up to this opening at the top of the thoracic cavity called the thoracic inlet. Basically, it's the hole at the top bordered by the first ribs, which are here, and the manubrium. And the thoracic cavity extends all the way down to the thoracic outlet which is closed by the diaphragm and borders the inferior aspects of the rib cage and to the bottom of the sternum. In the thoracic cavity, we have the right lung and the left lung. And between the lungs is the mediastinum, which we'll cover first. The mediastinum is split up into compartments, which are very important to know clinically because different processes happen in each of the compartments. And so the differential diagnosis for things in each of the compartments is going to be different. There are a bunch of ways to split up the mediastinum, but the easiest and most logical way is to use the fibrous pericardium as your landmark. So it's worth knowing a little bit about the pericardium. So the pericardium is the sac that the heart sits in with the fibrous component being the outermost layer, which you can actually see here on the CT. It inserts into the diaphragm inferiorly here and up all the way to the level of the roots of the great vessels. Here is the fibrous pericardium on the sagittal images. So everything superior to the pericardium and below the thoracic inlet is considered the superior mediastinum. The superior mediastinum contains trachea, esophagus, and a bunch of vasculature that we'll talk about later. The anterior mediastinum is anterior to the pericardium. 
so this space right here. In adult patients, it contains mostly fatty attenuation. Notice the attenuation here is similar to the subcutaneous tissues. But in younger patients, it can contain the thymus. It can also contain lymph nodes and sometimes thyroid, which is up here if it extends inferiorly. So that's why when you see an anterior mediastinal mass, the classic differential includes thymic lesions like thymoma, thyroid lesions, and lymphoma, amongst other things like teratoma and other germ cell tumors. The middle mediastinum is within the pericardium, mostly the heart, and the vessels joining the heart, including part of the ascending aorta, and the pulmonary trunk, the SVC. It also contains the tracheal bifurcation and some lymph nodes. And lastly, the posterior mediastinum is posterior to the pericardium. The posterior mediastinum, of course, contains the spine, the paraspinal nerves, the vasculature back here, and the esophagus. The differential for a posterior mediastinal mass is logical if you know the anatomy, with neurogenic tumors being the most common. Let's look through this anatomy in a bit more detail, starting with the middle mediastinum and the heart. So this here is the right atrium, which is where the major systemic veins drain, namely the inferior vena cava, or IVC, which defines the right atrium. This is coming from the lower body and the superior vena cava from above. This here is the right atrial appendage. And you can see this structure here as well called the crista terminalis, which is a muscular ridge running from the superior vena cava down to the IVC. It's a normal structure and not a clot. This is the right ventricle. Notice that normally it is pretty thin walled. Not so important for this introductory talk, but important in general. The right ventricle is defined by the moderator band, which is this band coming from the interventricular septum here and extending towards the margin of the right ventricle, also known as the septomarginal trabecula. You may not see it very well on routine CT, and for now, don't worry about it too much. The right ventricle pumps blood into the pulmonary artery. So this is the pulmonary trunk and the right and left pulmonary arteries. From here, blood goes into the lungs and then drains into the pulmonary veins. These are pulmonary veins that I'm pointing out. The pulmonary veins drain into the left atrium, which sits posteriorly here. This is the left atrial appendage. The left atrial appendage is a common location for blood clots to form. It's also a common area where you can see mixing artifact. The left atrium is normally less than four centimeters or so in AP dimension. Lastly, this is the left ventricle here. Notice the relatively thick wall compared to the right ventricle. You'll also notice the papillary muscles here. The left ventricle pumps blood into the aorta. So this is the aortic valve and the ascending aorta. Okay, and that's a nice segue to move from the heart to the vascular anatomy. So starting with the arteries, again, this is the aorta with the aortic valve, ascending aorta, aortic arch, and descending aorta. Important arterial branches to know include the coronary arteries. So this is the left coronary artery here with the left anterior descending, 
that extends down the interventricular septum and the circumflex as well as the right coronary artery which arises from the right coronary cusp. The three major branches of the aorta are first the brachiocephalic trunk which splits into the right subclavian and the right common carotid artery that I'm following now. The second major branch is the left common carotid artery and the third major branch is the left subclavian artery. Other clinically important arteries to be aware of, two arising from the subclavian vein are first the vertebral artery, which I'm following now, and second is the internal thoracic artery, here it is on the left, extending inferiorly along the anterior chest wall. Lastly, the intercostal arteries are important to be aware of clinically. They travel along the undersurface of the ribs. Even if you don't see them that well, they're important to know clinically, for example, if there is trauma and there's active extravasation or bleeding coming from this location, you know it's arising from an intercostal artery. All right, moving along, we briefly talked about the pulmonary artery here, including the pulmonary trunk, right and left pulmonary arteries. We'll cover the rest of the pulmonary artery branches all the way to the segmental level in a future video on CT pulmonary angiogram. Major veins to know include the left jugular vein, which joins the left subclavian vein here to become the left brachiocephalic vein. Similar on the right, the right subclavian vein and right jugular vein join to make the right brachiocephalic vein. The two brachiocephalic veins join to become the superior vena cava, which joins the right atrium. The arch of the azagus here joins the superior vena cava just above the level of the right main stem bronchus. So this is the right main stem bronchus here. Just above it is this arch of azagus joining into the superior vena cava. The azagus itself comes from inferiorly here and extends up to the level of the arch and it runs along the right side of the aorta in the posterior mediastinum. We mentioned the inferior vena cava that joins the right atrium inferiorly. One other vein I didn't mention earlier is the largest cardiac vein, also known as the coronary vein here, that runs along the posterior heart and drains into the right atrium as well. Moving along to the airways, this is the trachea that bifurcates into the right main stem bronchus and the left main stem bronchus. The tracheal bifurcation is also known as the carina. Notice that the right main stem bronchus here is a lot shorter than the left. Also know that the right main stem bronchus usually has more of an inferior angulation to it compared to the left which is why foreign bodies in aspiration tend to go down the right side more than the left. This here posteriorly is the esophagus, extending all the way down to the level of the GE junction and stomach. Before we go on to the lungs, one last important thing to touch on here are the lymph node stations. And we'll cover the most clinically important ones, so starting with the supraclavicular lymph nodes as well as the low cervical lymph nodes which are low in the neck, the prevascular nodes anterior to the great vessels here 
the aortopulmonary zone or AP window, which is just inferior to the aorta and above the pulmonary artery, hence A for aorta, P for pulmonary artery window, this space here. We have paratracheal nodes, which are surrounding the trachea. And that includes left paratracheal nodes. You can see a normal appearing lymph node here on the left, for example, and right paratracheal nodes. The dividing line between left paratracheal and right paratracheal is the left lateral border of the trachea. So left paratracheal nodes are out here and right paratracheal nodes are anterior and to the right. As we scroll down here past the carina, we have the subcarinal station. This is a normal subcarinal lymph node. And then more inferiorly and posteriorly, we have paraesophageal nodes if they happen to be present. We also have bilateral hilar nodes adjacent to the main stem bronchi. And then we have interlobar, lobar, segmental, and subsegmental nodes as you go outwards. But don't worry about those for now. Just understand the naming convention in the mediastinal nodes for now. Other important lymph nodes to be aware of in the chest include axillary nodes, bilaterally, internal thoracic nodes along the internal thoracic chain, and cardiophrenic nodes down here. Okay, so let's move on to the lungs themselves. So we'll start with the right lung, which is separated into three lobes by the fissures. So here on the sagittal images, you can see the oblique fissure here, and the horizontal fissure here which separates the lungs into the right upper lobe, right middle lobe, and right lower lobe. When I scroll through the axial images, we are in the upper lobe here. I can see the oblique fissure here. And so all of this posterior to the oblique fissure, just like on the sagittal images you can see are part of the lower lobe here. As I scroll down, you'll start to see the horizontal fissure, which is this line here. And so now we have the right upper lobe. This is above the horizontal fissure. Right middle lobe between the horizontal and oblique fissure down here. And this is all right lower lobe. On the left, we have only the oblique fissure separating the left upper lobe from the left lower lobe posteriorly and inferiorly. On the axials here again, you can see the oblique fissure. This is all upper lobe and posteriorly and inferiorly, this is all lower lobe. The inferior part of the left upper lobe is called the lingula here near the heart. Surrounding each of the lungs is a double layer of pleura. You don't actually see them when you have normal pleura on CT, but the space between these layers is called the pleural space. So you're going to be looking for things like pleural effusions that will fill that space dependently and when it's filled with gas and pneumothorax, amongst other pathology. All right, so that's the meat and potatoes of the anatomy that I wanted to cover. A few other things to briefly mention. We can see the lower neck here as well on CTs of the chest, including the thyroid gland. Notice how bright it is. We also have the entire chest wall, which includes subcutaneous fat, musculature, and bones. Starting with the bones, we have our ribs, starting from the first rib all the way down to the 12th rib. We have our spine posteriorly here. We have our manubrium 
and sternum anteriorly here. We have our bilateral clavicles, the acromioclavicular joints up here can sometimes be seen. This is the scapula back here. And then we can often see part of the humerus. On sagittal images, the spine and the sternum. There are many muscles that you can see on CT of the chest that are beyond the scope of this talk, including pectoralis major here and pectoralis minor bilaterally. Rotator cuff muscles back here, paraspinal muscles. We can also see quite a bit of the upper abdomen here. And we covered the anatomy here in detail in our CT abdomen and pelvis talk. I think that Keith, correct me if I'm wrong, that's the end of the hour. And happy to take any questions if there's time.